Geodwit, everyone. You are so welcome to Lighthouse Church Online today. Uh, so good to be able to connect with you wherever in the world you are watching from. A big shout out to all of my family and friends in my Navin location, uh, in my Dublin location, uh, all of our family and friends all around Ireland uh, who are watching. It is such a privilege uh, and a blessing uh, to be able to connect with you today with Church Online. A massive Mila Matagot again for just staying connected with us at this time. This crazy unpreet at the time. Uh, nonetheless, it has been good, has it, this week to get some kind of normality back uh, as kids go back to school, um, as some kind of you know, usual and familiar trends come back uh, to life. And we're, we're actually, despite the challenges that we're facing, very excited uh, as a church because there's a couple of really, really cool things that we're gonna, are going to be happening or going to be launching in the coming weeks uh, that I just can't wait to tell you. One of them, of course, I will tell you about is the fact that this month in September, we will be launching, relaunching all of our connect groups our connect groups, and I, and I just cannot wait uh, to be able to connect with all of my friends uh, in my connect group. What's so cool is there's two different kinds of groups now in line with, with government regulations. There's going to be in-person groups that'll be like no more than six people, which can meet in coffee shops, someone's home, and then there'll be digital e-groups, uh, which can be provided on whatever software uh, base you desire. But I cannot wait to uh, get groups back in line. In fact, one of the things that we're going to be sending you in the post this week is a little postcard. And on it, Osgueliga is the famous phrase that we used a lot at the beginning of lockdown, Ninyart Gakur Lechela. Uh, and if you don't know what that means, well, what's going to be really cool is you can actually flip that sucker over. And if you just take your iPhone or your smartphone and put the camera to this QR code, it will immediately take you to a link which explains what this means and also reveals to you some cool, exciting things that are happening in the church as it pertains uh, to uh, Connect Groups. So I want to encourage you, Make sure you're connected. And if, for every reason, you don't get one of those postcards in the post, guess what that means, everybody? That means you're not connected. We don't know who you are. And we don't know where you're at. And so we can't send you cool stuff. So if you want to be connected to us, please take the time to go to our website, lighthousechurch.ie, fill out the next steps uh, form. And then we'd love to send you one of these cool postcards and keep you up to date with all that's happening in the life of the church. And like I've been asking over the last couple of weeks as we continue our mission digitally, it would help me so much and help us so much if you could take the time, if you haven't done already, to like what you're watching on, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, to subscribe, to follow, uh, to befriend, and of course to share this content because we want to help as many people as we can at this time with the message. I believe that right now there are hundreds and thousands, even millions of people uh, in this country who are navigating their way through this COVID crisis, navigating their way through their own life story as it unfolds, navigating their way through all sorts of illnesses and, and challenges, financial, emotional, spiritual. They're navigating their way through life and we want to be a lighthouse to those people to help encourage and inspire him. So it would really be a blessing if you could take the time uh, to, of course, like, share, and subscribe. Now, today, I want to bring a message, a standalone message. We're going to be st starting a new series in two weeks' time. We'll tell you more about the next Sunday. It is a really cool series based off a really cool TV show. That's all I can say. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll give you more details. <clears throat> and I've called this message Summum Bonum. Summum Bonum, which actually is Latin for the highest good, the best, the highest ideal. I believe it was actually coined by the Roman philosopher Cicero to do, kind, of, kind of describe the highest form of good within philosophy. And of course, in modern day culture, it's used to describe what's the best thing? What's the best thing? You're constantly ask ourselves during COVID, what's the right thing? That's a very good question. But also, what's the best thing? Thing. What's the best thing? And so today I want to talk to you about, ironically, is I want to talk to you the subject of doors. I want to talk to you for a little while about doors because doors are one of those funny things, aren't they? Because doors are so a part of our life. I mean, think about it. For you to get into the space you're in right now, you went through at least one door. For you to get where you're going today, you're going to have to go through some doors. I mean, doors are all around us. They play a massive role in life. Doors sometimes protect us from what's outside. They protect us from fire. They're fire doors. They can help us get out quickly, like fire escape doors. Um, doors can 
can also be something that um, divide a certain line between a class or an area. Think about what really separates the arrivals and departures in the airport are some doors. A door separates those who are going and those who are coming. When you stand outside the, and of course many of us haven't done this for quite some time, outside the arrivals lounge and you wait for those doors to open and for your loved one to be liver, delivered to you safely, it's such a wonderful feeling. Doors, you know, are, are all around us in hospitals. You're waiting outside the door because maybe someone's ill inside or maybe you're outside the door to hear the good news about the baby you're waiting to be born. Maybe you were waiting outside a, a door of an office for a job interview, right? I always know that feeling of what it's like to sit there wondering, waiting, nervous, but going in, what will I say? Don't screw it up, don't sweat too much, don't give too much away, keep your cool, keep your calm, answer the questions. We've all been there. Maybe we've been in more challenging times. <laughs> Many years ago, I was uh, sitting down one day and I got a notification on my phone that my mother had sent me a picture on Facebook. Now usually, I don't know about you and how your family rolls, but usually when my mother sends me a picture on Facebook, it's of one of my children or a memory or something. Well, this particular day, I opened my, my Facebook and to my shock and horror, the photo that she had sent me is this one, which when you look at it, you go, well, what's that? It's a chair and some doors. Well, I kid you not, my friends, this is actually the uh, waiting area right outside the principal's office in my secondary school, where unfortunately, I'm, it's sad for me to say, I spent many Many a day sitting there waiting with my hung head in shame for my parents to come and retrieve me uh, and be confronted by the principal for the stuff that I had done. This is not a positive memory of a door. The, I, I couldn't wait to get out the other door and get as far away from that place as possible. Doors play a huge part in our lives. Doors open up opportunities. Doors close off memories. Doors separate us from loved ones. Doors are an incredible part of our life. And one of the things that I miss about church is I miss welcoming people through our door on a Sunday. Man, how I long for the day when we get to reopen our, 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 our church physically, our Sunday gathering physically, and get to stand at the door and just high five some people and hug some people and welcome everybody. And I just can't wait to see you all and be there and just, you know, seem like such a distant memory. I mean, something we took for granted every week, just welcoming people to church. I mean, now we long for it because it was so special. And as a pastor, nothing does my heart good quite like the moment when someone comes to church and they're unsure or skeptical. Maybe you're watching right now and you're not really a church person or a believer or a Christian. And, and you know what I'm talking about because it's very daunting, isn't it, to go to a church for the first time and you're kind of wondering, will they jump on me and tie me up and beat me into Christian submission? Or will there be some weird animal sacrifice? Or will I know the words? Or will I understand the terms? Or will everyone know I'm the one? I mean, all these kind of fears people think, have and go through when they're, when they're coming to church. And I love just being able to welcome people and, and see the kind of walls come down as they realize that even though we're slightly crazy, um, we're a normal kind of crazy, and that ultimately all we are is broken, ordinary people who've been saved and redeemed and restored by an incredibly perfect, extraordinary God. I love the moment when the light comes on, so to speak, in someone's heart and mind as they experience the presence of God in church. And I cannot wait and we will eventually get back to a place where we will be able to do this again. I cannot wait for that day. The point is, doors play a massive role in our life. And actually, in the scriptures, there's lots of references to the doors. I mean, Jesus himself said, I am the door, way to life. Jesus referred to uh, the way to heaven as a gate. I mean, there's many references. Jesus said, behold, I stand outside the door, I knock. There's all these references to doors. One of my favorite ones is found in Psalm 84, verse 10. And what I'm going to do today is a little bit different. Rather than kind of getting into the text uh, and going like five, six, seven, eight verses and all what, what we usually kind of do, I'm going to give you one verse today. I am going to explain a little bit of the context, that's important. But really I'm going to use the kind of verse um, metaphorically to describe or point out some things that I think God is trying to say to us this week as a faith community. Now, here's what I want you to do. If you haven't got a Bible right now, because I think this is kind of cool, um, would you pause the feed right now, pause right now, and go and get yourself a Bible? If you don't have a Bible, simply download the Bible app by version and follow me into Psalm 84, verse 10. I'll be reading from the NIV version. But if you have a Bible, pause the feed right now and get your Bible. I am blinking. I'm supposed to be paused. Anyway, so in Psalm 84, verse 10, here's what the verse says. It says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I mean, 
When I read that verse, straight away what comes to mind is that old 80s Christian rock band Petra. I remember that band? And the song Better is One Day in Your Courts. If you haven't heard that song, Google it. You're welcome. Um, Better is One Day in Your Courts, a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper. Here's the kind of key thought. In the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Now, understand that the book of Psalms, okay, it's it's the largest book in the Bible, it's right bang. If if ever ever a, a preacher or a speaker or someone asks you to open your Bible to the book of Psalms, just grab the middle of your Bible and open it and it'll land in Psalms. Psalms is literally right in the middle of the Bible. There are 150 Psalms, most of them were written by King David. We all know who King David was, the guy who kind of killed the giant Goliath and was the um, kind of first good king or great king of Israel um, after Saul. And, um, and what's important is that all these Psalms are actually songs, they're poems, okay, that were written, some to be declared, some to be read reflectively, some to be uh, kind of like a modern day song accompanied with music. Uh, all these songs were, were basically, um, e- the, the authors being humans, were trying to express raw and real emotion. The real emotions that we feel going through real life. There's Psalms that they talk about grief and loss and disappointment and depression and sadness. And you know, when your spirit is broken, you wonder where's God and you feel like, you know, but like there's, there's a whole bunch of Psalms that there's Psalms about joy and celebration, exuberance when everything seems to be going right in your life and there's everything in between. This Psalm 84, we're told, was written by this group of people called the Sons of Korah, okay? And actually, the Sons of Korah were a part of the Old Testament priesthood. And there's a kind of some controversy in their story, if you want to go back and look at what their ancestors did as they rebelled against Moses and Exodus. But nonetheless, they were kind of, they were, they were part of the priesthood and their job was kind of worship, to make sure that God's name and God's presence and God's Fame was always the way it should be. And they penned and put a comp- put music to many of these psalms. What this particular psalmist, the son of Korah, is saying is, what we can deduce from reading the full psalm, if you want to do that later as well, is that he was actually, one of his jobs as a Levite, a priest uh, in the Old Testament kind of system, was he was a doorkeeper in the temple of God. Now, what's the temple? Let me kind of explain some of these terms. Well, when, of course, Moses left Egypt and went into the promised land, um, God gave Moses the commandment to build a tabernacle. A tabernacle was like a, a tent-like structure in which the Ark of the Covenant, this structure here, which was like a box with two cherubim, which are basically angels, in which were the Ten Commandments and some manna and an Aaron's staff uh, from the book of Exodus. And basically this, this Ark symbolized God's presence with his people. And you couldn't just leave the ark lying around in the middle of a field, could you? Because it was God's presence. So they built this tent called the tabernacle. And there's all these really interesting mechanical things. If you're like an engineering-like person, you should go and read that. It's quite interesting. And wherever the Israelites would go, this tabernacle, this tent, this, this, this ark, this, this symbolic presence of God would go with them. Well, fast forward the clock, a couple of hundred years. And you got King David, and King David obviously loved the Lord, worshipped God, and he just, he just he had this this dissatisfaction in his soul. You know, sometimes people will ask me, how do I know what I'm called to do? How do I know what my calling is? Very often, your calling is revealed not by what you want to do, but what you but what you think someone should do. I mean, sometimes it's like what annoys you, what frustrates you, what upsets you, usually alludes a little bit to what you're passionate about. Some people think it's just wrong that um, there's people who are hungry in this world and someone should do something about that. Maybe your, your passion is working with poor people. Maybe you feel uh, uh, there's an injustice when it comes to the fact that there's still people in Ireland who are illiterate or still children who go to school hungry. Maybe your passion then is to help those people. Very often our passion is revealed in what we think is wrong. So David felt like it was wrong for God to live in a tent while he lived in a temple. So it was in David's heart to build a temple for God. Well, long story short, God said, well, that's great, David. However, you know, you've killed people. You know, you've, you've, you've taken the lives of other human beings. Your hands have blood in them. I don't want you to build a temple for me. But what I will do is I will accept the temple from your son. David's son, of course, is King Solomon, a very famous character. And he built this temple around 900 BC. And this is kind of like an artistic rendition of it, like a painting, a picture. But you can appreciate the scale. Here's kind of like a 3D computer version of what the temple could have looked like. And again, 
as you see, it's it's enormous. And what you can see as well is there's all these doors. I mean, this is the kind of inner temple. This is these walls are the outer temple. There would have been priests on all the entrances to make sure people were coming in and coming out, and no one was disrespecting or abusing the nature of uh, the temple. And this 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 doorkeeper, this Psalm 80, the author of Psalm eighty four, is basically he said all these wonderful things. You can read later on, verse one to ten, and he comes to the conclusion that better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere, and I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Okay, so that explains the Lev the Levite, the priesthood, the Korah, the sons of Korah, the Psalm, the poem, the temple. What does it really mean though? You ever do that? You ever read, a, read your Bible, read a verse and go, okay, that sounds so lovely, but I have no idea what it means. Well, basically, if you boil it down, the main thought that the author is trying to get across today and what I think is important for us to take with us in today's message is simply this. What he's saying in essence is, I'd rather be outside of God's house looking in for a moment than dwelling comfortably in the tents and the luxury of the wicked. I'd rather be outside peeking through the door. It's more valuable to me, more profitable to me, more important to me, more significant for me to be outside looking in at what God is doing and God's presence and God's people than be living it up in luxury, in style, in the tents of the wicked. Literally, better is one day, he says, in God's courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord, house of my God, than dwell in the tent of the wicked. One day in God's presence is better than a thousand anywhere else. I'd rather be outside looking in at God's presence and God's people, at God's house, than living it up and living large in the presence of sin. Now, there's three practical observations that I want us to see today as a church. Three things that I think are important as I was praying, thinking about this week and this message. This is kind of what I felt the Holy Spirit put in my heart for us. Um, and again, I want you to think about how these apply to you today, okay? Not just in a corporate sense, but you specifically, because I really believe God is speaking to us. The first observation that, that I want to see is this. There's a difference between beauty of place and beauty of person. Understand that as magnificent as that temple was, as magnificent as the house of God was, what the author is trying to get us to see is that it wasn't the temple that captivated him. It wasn't the physical structure that inspired him. It wasn't the beauty of the place. It was the person for whom the place existed. This is really important. Why? Because you can... If it was all about the temple, what happens when that temple is destroyed? And of course, that temple was destroyed by the Babylonians about 600 BC. Then, of course, it was rebuilt by Ezra and Nehemiah, two guys in the Bible. You can read the story later on, uh, a couple of hundred years before Jesus came. And then it was destroyed again in AD 70. So this thing was built and destroyed twice, okay? So what happens now when the place is gone? I ask you, Lighthouse Church, what happens to us as a faith community when our place is gone? Are we about buildings? Are we about bricks and mortar? Or are we a people of God? See, the, the author, the psalmist is trying to get us to see the structure serves a purpose. Nothing wrong with buildings. I mean, I would love to have some church buildings. We could do so much for, for our, our faith community, for our kids, for our youth, for our wider community, uh, if we had the resource for our own building. And I pray in Jesus' name one day we do. However, the purpose of a building is to serve the, serve the mission and vision of the church. It isn't the thing to be worshipped. How sad is it when you think about it in our own country, like Ireland, that many people point to a building with a steeple on the cross and say, oh, there's the church. And you go, really? And you walk up to it, you open the door and you look in, there's no one there. There's no one in there. How is the church? A church, by definition, by the, by the Bible's definition, is not a building. The church is a people. The church is the people of God. Paul re references this in 1 Corinthians 12. Peter says this in 1 Peter 4. I mean, it's quite clear. The church is never a building. The church is a people in the same way the author is saying, hey, even though the place is beautiful and we should, whenever we make something for God, we should make it beautiful. I really believe in the, in the importance of excellence. Whatever we do for God, we should do it to the best of our ability. When, I, when I'm talking to my children about doing something, whether it's 
doing their homework or going to school and having a good attitude or whatever. I said to them, hey, it's not just about your teacher, about your parents. This is, this is actually how you worship God. This is how you, you bring your best. You're not perfect. You're going to fail. Of course we all are. But to the best of your ability, do the best you can what you have because God deserves our best. God deserves the most beautiful songs that we can write. God deserves the most beautiful offerings that we can give. God deserves the most beautiful um, expressions of devotion and worship we can give. God deserves beautiful things because God created beauty, beauty and he is beautiful. But the person of God, the purpose of all these things is to point us towards the person. And, and, and this thing is so crucial that we see this. The author said, I'd rather be peeking in at the presence of God than living it up like a king in luxury. Why? Because the beauty of the place is secondary to the beauty of the person. What's he saying? He's saying, guys, we should be about God's presence. We should be about God's presence. When the place is taken away from us, what can we hang on to? What can we look to? What can we hope in, hope for? What can we hold on to? We can hold on to God's presence. And the beauty of God's presence is God's presence isn't in a little box anymore in a building in Jerusalem. God's presence is everywhere. And if you're watching right now and you're a Christ follower, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, if you are a disciple of Christ, God's presence lives in you. You are, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 6, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is again a, a, a temple. It contains in it the very presence of God. That's why wherever you're watching from today, you know, as, as important as it is to gather, I'll talk about in a second, uh, corporately as a church, even though right now you may find yourself alone, isolated, separate, disconnected, right now, wherever you're watching this from, God's presence is with you. And you can experience his love and his comfort and his strength and his power in your life if you would only open up your heart to him today. God's presence is with you. The second observation I want us to see is this. He kind of points out the difference between the quantity of life versus the quality of life. And again, that's captured in that first phrase. Better is one day in God's courts, one day in, in the vicinity of where God is, than a thousand anywhere else. Th think about some place you want to go. Have you had one of those conversations yet with a friend or a spouse or a parent? Like when lockdown ends, oh, when lockdown ends, where do you want to go? Like if I, if I could give you like an unlimited pass to go anywhere in the world right now, where would you go? Maybe let's make it even cooler. Let's remove the confines of time. Like you can time travel, okay? Like where would you go? Where would you spend a thousand elsewhere if you could? Think about it. maybe it's a beach, maybe it's a time with a family member, maybe it's a city, a restaurant, maybe it's a time in your life. I, I don't know where it is. Well, I know what the author is trying to get us to see, that he has concluded as he's peeking in at the presence of God, that I would trade a thousand, a thousand days anywhere else in this world for one moment in God's presence. Isn't that powerful? I would trade a thousand days of fame, a thousand days of wealth, a thousand days of health, a thousand days of significance, a thousand days of success, a thousand days of, of, of lying in a hammock, sipping a coconut on a beach. I would trade a thousand days of any of those things for one moment in God's presence. See, the point he's making is that life is not about the quantity. It's not about the number of days you have. You know, life isn't about the timeline. I mean, oftentimes when someone lives and dies or you see it go to a gravestone, it's so-and-so born this date and then died this date. It doesn't really tell you about the quality of what exists between those two dates. We're all going to have those two dates. We all were born at a moment and we're all going to die in a moment. But but our gravestone, and nor does our, our eulogy ever fully kind of... Um, capture the quality of what made us us the psalmist is saying what's important is not what we do or how long we have but it's who we become in this thing called life let me flip it over and apply it in a very real way to where we are right now we don't know how long the quantity of covid we don't know if it's a going to be a, a nine month thing as we're at, you know, here in the studio today and it's, it's September and it's been roughly, what, seven months well, since Ireland went into lockdown but, you know, since January since the virus kind of was, was, uh, was, you know, uh, rampant um, it could be a year-long thing it could be a two-year-long thing we don't know how long this thing is going to we pray that it comes to an end now, of course but we don't know what we 
do kind of know in terms of what we can control and decide is, what's, what, what are we going to do in this time? I mean, who are we going to become? What are we going to focus on? When we look back at COVID and, and what we did with the time given to us, what will we choose to do it? And I think that the idea of the courts <clears throat> is quite interesting because the courts were where the people gathered. Again, if you read the New Testament, many times disciples were arrested in the temple courts because, uh, like I showed you in the photo, it was this wider kind of wall where these courts, and then there was a temple in the middle. And, and what the author is saying, it's better to be amongst God's people. To, be, to have a moment in church is better than a thousand elsewhere. Now, I know not everyone who's watching today has that feeling, but and I, and I guess the author probably knew that too. I suppose what he's trying to do is inspire us to see that God's people, God's people matter. And that really, we should be uh, so captivated by God's presence that we go, man, the beauty of the place simply serves the beauty of the person. And that ultimately, one moment gathered with God's people corporately in God's presence is better than a thousand elsewhere. This is why for us, the church, this is why groups are so important. Being in a connect group, being in a group is so important. Why? Because you can't really experience Christianity by yourself. Because the scripture teaches us that we are the body of Christ. We are a faith community. We are supposed to be connected to one another. And uh, not just online, as good as this is, but in relationship. In relation, the best way that we can do that, do that is by finding a small cohort of friends. Really, that's what a group is. It's a group of friends. And maybe you don't have those friends right now. That's why you got to join one is to find some friends. Um, maybe you to, you know, uh, you've been kind of, you've been isolated because of COVID. You had some challenges and it's been tough. It's time to get back. It's time to get reconnected. It's time for all of us to, to understand the inspiration, the challenge that the author has given us by saying it's better to spend one moment in the courts of God's people, in the presence of God, and a thousand elsewhere. I want to encourage you today, friend. I want to encourage you to take the time to really think about, consider, and pray about joining a connect group, joining an e-group. And if there's something that you're passionate about, something that upsets you, oh man, I think we need more of this. Maybe that's the group that you should start. <laughs> Maybe there's other people out there like you who want to do something like what you have in your heart to do, but are waiting for someone to do it. And if someone just step up and start that thing, boom, there would be a group. Who knows? I want to encourage this is why we as a church don't do services and buildings alone, but why it's so important to us that we don't just show up to church on a Sunday for an hour and a half, tick the box and go home, but that we're living out our faith authentically. And uh, that was a real Irish, authentically. Authentically. <laughs> authentically. And vibrantly. And, and realistically in, in the world that we live. So God's presence is what he's pointing us towards. God's people is what he's pointing us towards. The third observation I want us to see today is simply this. That the doorway, okay, think about this. A doorway connects two rooms, two places, two spaces to each other, okay? And there's almost a sense somewhere, and we see this again, trust scripture, Jacob's ladder in the Old Testament. We see it again with Jesus coming to the world. This idea that this doorway is, is a connection between heaven and earth. That, that, that we as the church, we as God's people in God's presence are to connect heaven to earth, okay? But also earth to heaven. We're to connect heaven to earth, meaning we pray for God to bless our communities. We pray for God to bless our political leaders. We pray for the sick. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for our employers. We pray for our family. As God's people, we pray. We pray, Lord, let heaven come down to the earth. You know, this person is sick and doctors are saying there's nothing that, that can be done, but I know you have power to heal. So now in the name of Jesus, and right now, if you're watching me, if you're watching me right now and you're sick, you're carrying illness in your body. I want to pray for you right now in the name of Jesus that as you're watching this recording, you would be healed in Jesus' name, that you'd experience in your body the manifest power of God as it burns away that illness and makes you well. You go, how is that possible? It's not possible by earthly standards, but when heaven breaks into earth, all things that are impossible become possible because God is a God of the impossible. I pray for you in Jesus' name to be healed according to his good will for your life. As the church, we are the conduit. We are the doorway for heaven to break into the earth. But, 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 however, at the same time, we also have a responsibility to bring as many from earth to heaven as we possibly can. We also have a responsibility 
to be a light, to be a witness, to be the voice of God in the world, to speak the good news to our friends and family. And think about what better time could there be in our lifetime to speak about the goodness and graciousness, the mercy, the hope, the peace, the joy that we have in Jesus. We don't need to get get all convoluted and all uh, um, academic on people. It doesn't have to be a philosophical debate. It can just be very really saying, hey, I want you to know about the God of heaven and what he can do in your life. In other words, the psalmist is saying, when we're in God's presence, as God's people, then we see God's purpose. And God's purpose becomes our purpose. And I want to remind you, church, today, I want to remind you that we have a purpose. Even though, excuse me, even though we're locked down, even though we're limited in what we can do, we don't just give up. We don't say time out. We don't fall asleep. We pray, we watch. Jesus said, be watching, be praying, be ready, be prepared, stay alert. The Apostle Peter says, we're alert, we're watching. Where's the opportunity? Where can we be the church? Where are people in need? Where can we pray? Where can we go? Where can we help? Where can we heal? Where can we speak? Where can we serve? We're always looking for opportunities to be a lighthouse. That's what a lighthouse does. It stands in the darkness. It stands in the face of the wind and the waves and the adversity. It stands at the very limits of a particular region, area, or land, and bravely and boldly and consistently and defiantly just shines that light out across the sea. In fact, when I was preparing for this message, I found a really cool definition of what a lighthouse is. It says a lighthouse, a structure such as a tower, uh, it, sorry, a lighthouse is a structure such as a tower with a powerful light that gives a continuous or intermittent, intermittent signal to navigators. That's according to Merriam-Webster. I love it. A lighthouse is a structure that stands in the face of adversity and gives a continuous light to signal those navigators. I believe right now there are so many people trying to navigate this time. It's COVID season, personally, spiritually, financially. And I don't have all the answers for all those people, neither do you. And my job isn't to be the answer for all those people. The, the, the author in the psalm isn't saying, look to me, look how great I am. I have the answers. He's saying, look to God's presence. Consider God's people. And be reminded that God's purpose to us, our purpose, is to be a lighthouse. To bring heaven to earth. And see lives transformed so many from earth get to come to heaven. We don't know how many days we have. It's not really the quantity of days that we have, but the quality of days that we have as a people of God on earth to shine. I want to encourage you this week, even right now. Is there a person you can text right now with an encouraging word, a scripture, maybe even with this link? Is there a person that you can encourage right now? I mean, if, if needs be, pause that feed again. Get your phone out. Let, let, let's be proactive people. Let's do it now. Right now, Holy Spirit, give the names and faces of people into the minds and hearts of everyone watching as to who they should text right now. It can be as simple as, hey, praying for you. It can be as simple as, I want you to know that I have your back. It can be as simple as, simple as, how are you doing? I mean, really doing. It can be a scripture. I don't know what it is, but how can we as a people of faith be inspired this week to shine that light to all those navigators? Maybe it's a matter of in school this week or in work, looking for opportunities. Maybe it's that person in the corner that no one wants to talk to. Be the person, be the light. Go talk to that person. Show them the love and grace of Jesus. Maybe it's a situation in your street or neighborhood. Maybe there's someone who is going through a difficult time and you notice their grass is, is a little bit overgrown. If you come by my house, you might see I'm, I'm that neighbor right now. Maybe God is saying, you go and you know, be, a, be a physical blessing. Cut their grass for them, man. Maybe drop some money in someone's letterbox. Just bless them. I don't know what the Holy Spirit might say to you, but I want to encourage you, church. Let's be a people of faith. Let's be a people of the presence. Let's be a community who are gathered uh, in the courts. But let's also be a people of purpose. Let's be a lighthouse, not only in name, but also in action. Now, as I bring this thing to a close, let me finish with a story. Many of you will have seen this week in the news the tragic passing of uh, Chadwick Boseman. Chadwick Boseman, of course, was a, a well-known Hollywood actor who died tragically this week after a four-year battle with uh, cancer. Um, most of you watching right now know him as the Black Panther. 
uh, from the Mar Marvel series. Amazing actor, amazing movie, uh, an amazing story. Very tragically, of course, he passed away this week and our thoughts and our prayers are with his wife and his family and everyone who um, held him dearly. But when we think of Black Panther, we think of Chadwick Boseman, we think of the movie star, the success, this guy who made it, like he got through the door. I mean, there was a moment in time, right, where he was sitting in a waiting room, waiting for the audition, waiting for that breakthrough. I mean, he didn't just by accident end up on Marvel screens. I mean, he had a dream to be an actor, he had a dream to succeed and, and so on the way. And maybe it wasn't just one, maybe it was many doors where he had to overcome and he had to go through the selection process to make it to the point that he made it. Well, there was one particular door that really defined his life. It was a door in Hollywood that got him his first real gig as a Hollywood actor because he had applied to an acting school, unfortunately because of his background, didn't have the funds to go. He couldn't get, he couldn't, he couldn't make, he couldn't open this door in his own strength. And all of a sudden one day he got a phone call to say that a, a very generous benefactor, okay, someone who was moved by faith and inspired by God, basically was willing to pay for his tuition to make that door uh, open, to create a possibility to, for him to fulfill his dream and live his life. life. And you agree with me, even though his days didn't have great quantity, for the most part, they impacted all of us because they were of great quality. Watch this clip as Chadwick himself describes the story and who the benefactor is. I know personally that your generosity extends past what you have given on the stage and screen. Many of you already know the story that Mr. Washington, when asked by Felicia Rashad to join her in assisting nine theater students from Howard University who had been accepted to a summer acting program at the British Academy of Dramatic Acting in Oxford. He gracefully and privately agreed to contribute. As fate would have it, I was one of the students that he paid for. <laughs> Imagine receiving a letter that your tuition for that summer was paid for and that your benefactor was none other than the dopest actor on the planet. <laughs> I have no doubt that there are similar stories at boys and girls clubs and theaters and churches across the country where I know you have also inspired and motivated others. An offering from a sage and a king is more than silver and gold. It is a seed of hope, a bud of faith. There is no Black Panther without Denzel Washington. <laughs> And not just because of me, but my whole cast, that generation, stands on your shoulders. The daily battles won, the thousand territories gained, the many sacrifices you made for the culture on film sets through your career, the things you refused to compromise along the way laid the blueprints for us to follow. And so now, let he who has watered be watered. Let he who has given be given to. It is an honor to now know you, to learn from you, and join in this work with you. May God bless you exceedingly and abundantly more in what's in store than he ever has before. God bless you. Wow, what an amazing, that's, come on, let's give a massive round of applause. What an amazing legacy and video. I love how he says, there be no Black Panther without Denzel Washington. And, uh, you know, I just think it's amazing because, again, this, this uh, dream of, of being a Hollywood actor and inspiring millions and all the work that obviously Chadwick did behind the scenes to help children in poverty wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the generosity, if it wasn't for the vision, if it wasn't for the willingness of someone to work in the background and open that door. Lighthouse Church, I'm asking you today, will you be a doorkeeper? Will you be a doorkeeper? Will you be someone that first and foremost, he says, you know what? It's not about buildings or places or temples. It's about God's presence. And whether in your living room, on a bus, a train, a plane, whether you're um, out in a park right now, wherever you are, you can experience God's presence right where you're at. It's about God's people. That we don't just watch church or go to church, but that we are the church, that we are connected to one another relationally, that we're strong, together we are the people of God. 
and that we are committed to the, to the mission, to the vision, to the purpose of why Jesus left us here on the earth to bring heaven to earth through our prayers and through our, our, our walk with God, but also to see lives changed so earth can come to heaven. This is Sonam Bonham. This is the highest good. This is what's best right now. And every one of us, we can do this today. So I want us to pray. I'm going to ask you to stand if you can. If it's not too awkward, if you're in the middle of a coffee shop, uh, probably don't stand. Um, it might freak everyone out. But if you're at home in a safe place, I want to invite you to stand right now. I want to very quickly pray for us as we bring this service to a close. Father, I thank you. I thank you, God, because you have given us the gift of your presence. It is a comfort. It is uh, something that directs us. It is power that's made available in our lives in our time of need. Thank you, God. You have given us a faith community, not a church to go through to, but a church to belong to, not a church to watch, but a church to be part of. Help us, Father. Give us wisdom this week and next as e-groups and connect groups launch to find our group of friends, our spiritual cohort, our band of brothers, that we can be connected in such a way that we live out our Christianity in your courts, Lord, in your presence, God, as you desire us to do. And finally, God, I pray, as every one of us, Lord, lives out our lives in school, in college, Lord, in work, uh, at home, with our neighbors, with our family, help us to be a lighthouse, a strong, continuous light that shines for all those who are navigating this life to see. May heaven come to earth today, Lord. And may we, as a result, see many of those, Lord, who are on earth come to heaven because of your grace, your mercy, your love. We love you and we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. I'll see you during the week.